Chapter 2 2.15 a.m. Local time. Embassy of the People's Republic of China. Tripoli. It's damn well late at night, or early in the morning. In the ground floor reception room for the Chinese embassy on Monastere Street and Gargarish Road, and Jiang Lijun, who's listed on the embassy guest list as a vice president for the China State Construction Engineering Corporation, is stifling a yawn. This supposed party was to have ended more than an hour ago, but the special guests from this blasted country still won't leave. The political leaders, the tribesmen, and the military officers, gaudy in their uniforms, stripes, and medals, like little boys playing dress-up, are still smoking, drinking, and talking to their patient hosts in various corners of the room. Jiang sees that the local representatives from the Great Wall Drilling Company, CNPC Services and Engineering, China National Petroleum Corporation, and so many others are valiantly standing in for Zhongguo, the middle country, by smiling, laughing at the stupid attempts at humor, and otherwise entertaining their peasant guests. And what barbarians. Even after the lights were dimmed, the near-empty food platters were taken away, and the liquor and bottles of beer, Carlsberg, Heineken, Tsingtao, were removed. These peasants didn't get the message that it was time to wander back to their flea-infested hovels. No, they stayed and gossiped, and some even pulled flasks of liquor from their coat pockets. Even here, in this supposedly Muslim country. When he was an exchange student at UCLA in California, and then at Columbia in New York, a young Tiang thought he would never encounter a more childish, reckless, and ignorant group of uncouth people. But these Libyans make the Americans seem like honorary Han. He takes out a pack of Zhonghua cigarettes and lights one. He's standing by himself near two large potted plants, seeing who is talking to whom which members of the embassy staff look drunk or impatient, and observing the groupings of Libyan guests. A very fragile ceasefire and reconciliation government arose last year. But Jiang still wants to see which tribe members stay away from their alleged fellow countrymen, perhaps setting the stage for a future breakup or civil war. Good information to have ahead of time. A slim, bespeckled embassy worker wearing an ill-fitting black suit comes in from the far side of the banquet room. He scans the crowd as he hurries across the polished floor. Ling, that's the boy's name. Jiang takes one last puff of the cigarette, stubs it out in the dirt of the nearest potted plant, and waits. The worker comes to him, bows slightly, and says, My apologies, sir. Your presence is requested in the basement, room 12. Jiang nods, starts walking across the room, whereupon a heavy-set, bearded man, swaying drunk and wearing typical tribal garb of billowing white blouse and black slacks, abruptly steps in front of him. Mr. Jiang, he calls out in accented English, grasping Jiang's shoulders. And Jiang keeps a wide smile frozen on his face, trying not to choke from breathing in the alcoholic fumes coming from this dirty peasant. Are you leaving? Are you? Jiang pats the man's worn hands, gently tugs them off his shoulders. I'm sorry, my friend, but you know how it is, he replies, also in English, the lingua franca of diplomacy in so many parts of the world. Duty calls. The man, Jiang can't recall his name, only knows he's the leader of one of the 150 or so tribes in this barren land, sways again belches and says, Duty, yes. Tears come to his eyes. I must say this, I must. But your duty, your presence here, it has brought so much to our land. The Italians, the French, the British, the Qataris, the damn Egyptians. They have all tried to rule us, take our resources. Who would think? The yellow race would travel halfway around the world to shower us with your wisdom and knowledge.